Gnosticism and Genshin Impact, two terms that are becoming more and more linked with every Genshin update. But what is Gnosticism, and why are so many Genshin lore deep divers convinced it has helped them crack the entire plot of Genshin? Today we're going to discuss the origins of Gnosticism, the universal basic beliefs of the various Gnostic sects, basic similarities between Gnosticism and Genshin, and why the decision to use Gnosticism as the basis for Genshin's lore is genuinely ingenious. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, feel free to listen in, maybe leave it playing as background noise. And with that, let's dive into the poisonous vision. Hello. As this is my first official YouTube video, please bear with a brief intro and thank you. I will provide time codes to skip ahead in the description and video. My name is Poison Vision. I have a TikTok where I cover bite-sized aspects of Genshin lore. In particular, I like to connect Genshin's canon to outside lore sources. Please feel free to browse it below if that piques your interest. I would like to thank the one of you who has already come from TikTok and subscribed. I am truly very grateful. You are extraordinarily early, as there was nothing much here yet, but I thank you for subscribing anyway. With that all being said, let's move on to section 1. Section 1. On the origins of Gnosticism. Gnosticism is derived from the Greek gnosis, meaning to know. But when we look at the origins of the belief system, to understand may be a more apt definition. Before we discuss Gnosticism, we need to describe early Christianity. Early as in, the disciples were still alive, from roughly 0 AD to 100 AD. I will be using AD and BC as opposed to CE and BCE, as it simply makes more sense when discussing early Christianity and Gnosticism. Christianity was in its infancy and was developing and cementing itself, so let's discuss some key aspects of Christianity at this time. Christianity was a reformation of the Jewish faith, but preached primarily to the Gentiles, or non-Jewish born, for the first time. As such, many cultures and faiths are rapidly mixing with Christianity. This was not the first time the Abrahamic religion experienced mixing with another religion. In fact, some biblical historians believe Judaism may in fact originate from a polytheistic religion. But at this current point in time, the Catholic Church is defining itself and deciding which aspects of Judaism will remain, what will be reformed as per Christ's teachings, and what will be adapted to the new cultures as they convert. A word on religion and faith before I continue. I do not wish to take a stance for or against Christianity or any other faith with this video. I recognize that religion can be a core aspect of one's very being, something to ignore, or something that may have even caused harm. However, we need to discuss understanding the Christian Bible. Nowadays, we tend to have three major outcomes when people begin to study the Bible and its historical connections. The first is to discount anything that goes against the exact wording of the Bible, and accept a particular version of the Bible as absolute fact. The second is to accept that there may be some inaccuracies with minor details and embrace scientific teachings, yet still hold on to faith and rely on the ineffability of God as a means to reconcile faith and modern findings. The last outcome is to completely embrace science or historical findings and reject Christianity, becoming agnostic, atheist, or turning towards another religion or belief system. I am not for or against any of these outcomes, but we must understand that these three options were not the only options available during the early periods of the church. In fact, there was one outcome that quickly became a trend. Biblical philosophy and scholarship. Remember, the New Testament was being written. Preaching of the new faith began without a gospel to refer back to, merely anecdotes and lessons from Christ. St. Peter himself, who was the first bishop of Rome, or Pope as the position is commonly referred to, was the eldest of Christ's disciples. He has famously walked on water, received visions directly from the Lord, was given the power to help form the tenets of Christianity, and is named the Keeper of the Gates of Heaven. He was undeniably Christ's right-hand man. Yet St. Peter never wrote a gospel. The only texts we have from him are saved letters of him advising other religious leaders. He was asked to write or dictate a gospel countless times. As his experience was deemed invaluable, he refused every time, as he simply thought the Bible, and certainly a new gospel, held little, if any, value. He focused on the Catholic Church instead, as he believed that would be the best way to follow Christ's teachings and help spread those teachings to the Gentiles. But here we have our first clue to the origins of Gnosticism. Does the Bible matter? If so, how? As an absolute or guiding entity? And what to make of the poetic language often used? Modern Catholicism has an additional book to the Bible referred to as a catechism. It details what Catholics believe in and is about as thick as a Catholic Bible. It goes into detail on aspects of the Bible and completely adds on other parts as well. For those of you who think this is ridiculous, I ask you how many angels and demons are named in the Bible? Which version of the Bible? Is Lucifer even referred to as the devil? The truth of it 
is that much of what we take as Christian belief nowadays was cemented over two millennia of philosophizing, deep diving of texts, and introspection. It is a known truth that the Bible has been edited multiple times. Things have been lost to translation, edited for clarification, and even whole books have been removed, some likely lost to time. In our current era, this is mostly ancient history, and the only biblical debates will be on what particular sect of Christianity or the other Abrahamics you happen to follow. At the birth of Gnosticism, this was in vogue. One very important thing to note that I will get into more throughout this video is that we do not know much about the Gnostics. In part, this is due to the sheer fact that Gnosticism is exceedingly old. It was likely founded sometime between 90 and 180 AD, and estimates place it closer to the late 1st than the late or middle 2nd. From its conception, numerous sects and groups were formed that adapted the initial doctrines for their own. However, the last major decline occurred in roughly 844 AD. A sect, the Mandians, did survive to the modern day, though estimates place their numbers at around 60 to 70,000 today. Other modern Gnostic believers find their origins post-1945 with the discovery of the Nag Hammadi Library, considered to be the most important of all Gnostic literary findings. What this means is that the origins of Gnosticism occurred roughly 1,900 years ago. It nearly completely died out 1,200 years ago, and only minor traditions or references to their legacies have been recorded since. The second part of why we do not know much is that many texts referring to Gnosticism actually speak out against it. This includes early Christians all the way to Chinese emperors, which means that the first-hand accounts from Gnostics are exceedingly rare. This is of import as when I speak on the origins of Gnosticism, a lot of this is not concrete, but rather archaeological and historical hypotheses based on the few facts that are known. We mentioned a lot about the early Bible. That is because I have taken the more widely held notion that Gnosticism was born out of Christianity. Some argue that it may be older, in fairness, Gnosticism does pull from sources far older than Christianity. Yet the exact beliefs and the rise of sects appear to have formed post the writing of the last part of the Gospel in roughly 90 to 95 AD. And this falls in line with what many Gnostic scholars have pointed out, that much of Gnostic teaching appears to originate in further exploring particular lines from the Bible. I will go further into the details when discussing the core Gnostic beliefs, yet here is an example of adapting the biblical text. This is a quotation from 1 John in the New Jerusalem Bible 519. We are well aware that we are from God, and the whole world is in the power of the evil one. This quote led many Gnostics to deduce that the world was inherently evil, and there was no salvation to be had other than escaping from this current world. It is easy to see here how quickly things began to deviate. After all, Christianity certainly holds that heaven is a better place than earth, and that the earth is more ripe with temptation. However, this did not lead the Christians to believe in a demiurge, a key aspect of Gnostic philosophy, or to condemn the God of the Old Testament. Indeed, the concept of the demiurge is also present in John's writing. The book of John speaks of a prince of the world who will soon be driven out and has no power when compared to Christ. Earlier translations call the prince an archon, a Greek term for ruler. So many of the Gnostic beliefs come simply from attempts to understand lines like this within the New Testament which of course leads to looking back at the Old Testament and even to the beliefs of other religions around them. So that is roughly the basic origins of Gnosticism. I will continue this section with a brief timeline of Gnostic sects and other major Gnostic events. Many consider Simon, a disciple of John the Baptist, to be the first known Gnostic leader, yet he was often described as a magician who seduced the people of Samaria. We know he worked for Emperor Claudius from 41 to 54 AD. He appears to have been worshipped by his followers as a Christ-like figure. He had a follower named Helena of Tyre, whom he rescued from a brothel. He named her the mother of all, whom he had created as the first thought, titled Anoia. She had created the angels and powers in the lower worlds, yet they turned on her and forced her into a reincarnation cycle, trapped in mortal forms. Simon Magnus also repeatedly clashed with St. Peter in Rome. He allegedly once attempted to fly over the city to prove his divinity, but St. Peter called upon Christ, which brought him crashing to the ground which led to his death. Another interpretation of his death is that he was buried alive as he would surely resurrect within three days' time. He did not. However, for all his Christian contemporaries ridiculed him, he undoubtedly created the first Gnostic sect in Samaria. This sect was large enough to be considered a threat by Christians of the time. This sect was likely an early version of the Barbello Gnostic system, which believes that a supreme power, or sometimes called the unknown god by Gnostics, creates a world through his first thought, Anoia, from there, the rest of the world is born, and human souls fall into servitude. 
Simon was believed to be a redeemer of human souls and an embodiment of the supreme power. Some argue that Christians may have misinterpreted his teachings and that Helena stood for a human soul and the brothel was a metaphor for the world. The next Gnostics were Menander and Sartornilos, disciples of Simon Magnus. Menander likely died in 80 AD. He was also from Samaria and furthered Simon's works. Saturnilos was from Syria and began to differ from Simon. This included forming an ascetic sect that strongly distinguished between good and evil humans. He was likely the earliest of the Christian Gnostics and lived till roughly 150 AD. The next classic Gnostic reference comes with Arrhenius of Lyons, who took up the position of Bishop of Lyons and likewise spoke against Gnosticism. His main work was titled Exposure and Refutation of the Falsely So-Called Gnosis. We do not know when this work was written, but likely sometime between 177 AD and 200 AD. Here we see that in the second century, Gnosticism spread from Palestine and Syria, outwards into Egypt, Greece, Asia Minor, and even Rome. The three main sects were founded by Basilides, Marcion, and Valentinius. Not much is known of Basilides compared to the other sects, yet he clearly placed more influence on faith rather than Gnosis. Marcion was the first to create a separate church for Gnosticism, yet was still considered a Christian Gnostic. The Marcionites also gave birth to the earliest version of the Gnostic Demiurge. Valentinianism is the last great Gnostic sect, and probably the most well-known. The Valentinian system has given us no fewer than six mostly complete descriptions across texts deeming it heretical so it is one of the more well-known sects in terms of beliefs and details. Valentinius was born around 100 AD and narrowly lost a contest to become pope during his lifetime, which also speaks to how popular his beliefs were at the time. Even those who spoke out against his beliefs regarded him as an excellent teacher. In Rome, the Gnostic rise ends in the 2nd century, yet the 3rd century saw a Gnostic golden age in Mesopotamia. This was with the beliefs of Mencheism, the founder was Manny, born very specifically on the 14th of April, 216 AD, in Seleucia, Sistaphon, Persia. His father had been a member of a Gnostic sect, and he learned Gnosticism early on. Manny likewise was seen as a prophet of Gnostic light, and his martyrdom in 276 further cemented this belief. The Manichean church went through a few periods of growth and decline over the centuries. In about 300 AD, their teachings can be found as far as Syria, Northern Arabia, Egypt, North Africa, Palestine, Asia Minor, Armenia, Rome, Dalmatia, Gaul, and Spain. And writings describing them as heretics continue until the 500s. Some believe the church just split off into various sects at this time. However, the Manchian church still flourished in the east. The first apostles made it to China in 694. It was even named the state religion of the Ugar Empire in 762 AD. The empire collapsed in 840 AD, but the church continued until the Mongolian invasions of the 1200s though the Portuguese state that the Manchians exist in southern China as late as the 1600s. In 1945, the largest Gnostic library, the Nag Hammadi, was found in southern Egypt. Most of the 13 codices were written in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. When repeat texts are factored out, this discovery led to 46 new, never-before-seen texts. It was one of the greatest modern finds for Gnosticism, and led to a rebirth in much of their beliefs and thinking. Currently, there are still 60 to 70,000 Mandian Gnostics living in Iraq a separate sect from the Manchians who can trace their origin back to John the Baptist. They are exceedingly proud of their 2,000-year-long heritage and are still a resource to the study of Gnosticism to this day. Now that we've discussed their history, let's discuss their beliefs. Section 2. The Basics of Gnosticism Though each of the various sects hold their own beliefs, and these beliefs evolved over time, certain themes and core beliefs remained universal. The first of which is Gnostic creationism. The world was born from a supreme power or being. This being is referred to as the One, the One Who Is, the Unknown God, the Non-Being God, and the Abyss. The specific term will differ based on the sect. This supreme being created the Aeons, beings that would populate Pleroma, the Gnostic term for heaven directly translated as fullness. These Aeons often appeared in male and female pairs called Syzygies. Sophia, sometimes named Anoia, sometimes Anoia was Barbello, was the last of the Aeons to be created. Sophia wanted to demonstrate her own thoughts upon the world by creating a being in her likeness, but she did so without permission from the supreme being nor consent from her partner. The creature was born as a mix of serpent and lion with flame-filled eyes. She cast the being out and hid it upon a throne in a cloud where only the Aeon equivalent of the Holy Spirit, Zoe, could see it. This being was the Demiurge, the first Archon. Demiurge was a term taken from Plato simply meaning the creator of the world. It was never intended to be evil. His Gnostic names include 
Yaldau Bath, Child of Chaos, Sakwa, Fool, and even Samael, Blind God. He began to produce his own Aeon-like beings. And the number here gets confusing. Some say 12 angels with 7 archons and 3 powers under each, for a total of 365. Some specify 7 for the heavens and 5 for the underground. The concept of 7 archons for 7 planets appears a lot, as the ancient world believed in the 7 luminaries, including the Sun, Moon, Venus, Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, and Saturn. This is because any celestial object past Saturn was not visible prior to stronger telescopes. These luminaries are organized by brightness rather than the distance to reflect that. These seven luminaries influence the weekdays and various astrological systems. They are also often referenced as seven heavens or worlds. Ergo, there was often an archon appointed to each. Because the Demiurge had been created wrongly, he was doomed to only create suffering and evil for his creations. When Sophia saw this, she was distressed and sought redemption. Many beliefs say she was in a state of repentance for her crimes, sometimes confined close to Pleroma. The Demiurge in his creation saw glimpses of the divine Adam and wanted to copy it for themselves. Gnostic basis for this is that the Old Testament God declares himself a jealous God, forbidding the worship of others. While modern teachings take this to mean do not worship false gods, sometimes deemed demonic in origin, Gnostics took this to mean that there must be more gods on the same level as the Old Testament God. Therefore, he cannot be a supreme god. Yet because the Demiurge had been created wrongly, he could not replicate the divine Adam. Yet emissaries from Pleroma advised him to breathe his spirit into Adam. This spirit contained the last spark of the connection to the Supreme Being, allowing humans to contain that divinity within themselves. As now Adam was wiser and more spiritual than his creators, the Demiurge and the Archons reacted in jealousy, separating the divinity and putting it in Eve. Yet this only allowed the two to recognize each other as a divine pair. Gnostics believe that the serpent was in fact Christ, who urged the pair to eat the apple to learn of the damnation of their creator. Gnostics also believe that Seth was the first child to be born consensually of Adam and Eve, and that Cain and Abel descended from the Demiurge. This myth gives the basis for all Gnostic beliefs. Gnosis was used to describe a particular kind of insight to the world as a whole, one that would enable its holder to achieve immortality, or even to transcend past the Demiurge-created world. The idea of Gnosis was that salvation could be experienced prior to death. To remain ignorant was to remain a slave. To gain knowledge was to be redeemed. In Gnosticism, the concept of self-redemption versus an outside redeemer varies amongst the sects, as many view Christ as an aeon who enlightened humanity so that they could redeem themselves. So Christ is an outside redeemer, some say a necessity as the demiurge world is a closed and flawed system. Others argue humans could have done it themselves, but Christ the aeon simply made it easier. Gnosis itself was difficult to obtain, and many saw Christ's teachings as a means to achieve it, but also lamented that baptism would not work for everyone, as once one had achieved Gnosis, that was the complete means for salvation and one would be enlightened, and not every baptized individual had done that. While there are more concepts to be learned for each Gnostic sect, those are the core concepts that determine how the whole faith progresses. In this next section, we will look deeper at some of the basic elements that are comparable with Gnosticism in Genshin. Section 3. My Genshin lore theorists obsess over Gnosticism. As I have been going through the historical and theoretical foundations for Gnosticism, I think many Genshin fans have already begun to pick up on familiar terms and themes. I'm not going to give a deep dive into the exact connections and theories, as there are plenty of more in-depth videos on each and every similarity. I am simply going to list out some of the main ones as justification for why so many lore theorists begin to dive deeper into Gnostic lore. The first is Gnosis itself, a common term and theme in Gnosticism that leads one to enlightenment. In Genshin Impact, every Archon received a Gnosis from Celestia, that allowed them to become an Archon. Archons being another commonality, especially the fact that we have seven, and in Gnostic lore they were each given a realm to rule and alter to their whims. Genshin Impact copies this near exactly, though instead of planets, they are given nations. Genshin Impact begins with an unknown god. This term directly refers to the supreme powers in Gnosticism. The Abyss also features prominently as an entity outside Genshin's world of Teyvad, and could also imply these outside powers. Genshin also refers to the heavenly principles, which could be the most likely connection to the Supreme Being. Genshin's starting unknown foe has been theorized to be Sophia, which has some evidence to support it. The Traveler themselves, the main character in Genshin Impact, may be an Aeon. We do have enemies with Aeon in their name, like the Aeon Blight Drake, which shows that the developers are at least familiar with the term. Another hint is that we can be either the male Traveler or the female Traveler, which makes us a Saizuki's pair. 
The Travelers also directly called it asunder in Genshin. Without going too deep into a particular theory, Gnostic Judaic texts speak of a descent to Merkaba, or a descent to the throne of God, where in which the descender attempts to gain Gnosis in order to reach the true God. This descender is directly referred to as a Traveler, and has to face all seven Archons before they are able to meet the Supreme Being, a strikingly close comparison to Genshin. In fact, there are even more links with this particular myth and Genshin Impact, but I will leave it there for now. Another fun one is the hypostasis. In Gnosticism, hypostasis appears frequently as a term referring to one's true nature, or sometimes the truth of the world itself. In fact, one of the surviving Nag Hammadi texts from the 2nd or 3rd century is called the hypostasis of the Archons, or the reality of the Archons, and describes Gnostic beliefs about the Archons. There are hypostases in Genshin Impact, one for each element and Archon, and many believe there to be a connection between them. There are numerous more connections between Gnostic beliefs and the lore and storyline of Genshin Impact. I will leave the common similarities here, as frankly there are already a plethora of analyses on specific connections, and certain ones that I could elaborate more on require their own video to fully dissect. So up till now we have looked at the origins of Gnosticism, the basic beliefs of Gnosticism, and the connection between Gnosticism and Genshin Impact. We will now move on to the last part, which explains why Genshin Impact's use of Gnosticism is ingenious. Section 4. Using Gnosticism is exceedingly clever. First off, as I mentioned before, Gnosticism is lesser known. Not many know of it, and certainly not the full extent of the theories and beliefs. This is opposed to more classic lore like demonology or Greco-Roman myths, which are frequently used and already known by most media consumers. Seen as Genshin is created by Mihoyo, a Chinese company, it also deviates from Buddhist and traditional Chinese beliefs. Therefore, it is able to surprise a lot of fans by following a riveting, already present storyline, yet having it be rare enough that it is not immediately revealed. Furthermore, Gnosticism pulled from many sources, not only all three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it also pulled from Zoroastrianism, Greek and Egyptian mythology, earlier religions of the Middle East, early European religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. This is exceedingly relevant, as if we look at the Genshin Impact Nation so far, we can see that their real-world counterparts all experience Gnosticism. We know Gnosticism reached as far as Gaul, which covers Fontaine, Sumeru strongly reflects the very birthplace of Gnosticism, Liu as China reflects that Gnostic sects existed there as late as the 1600s, Inazuma and Shnaznaya are the only two nations without an overt connection. Yet, given the religions covered, there is a distinct argument to be made that they would have had some knowledge or connection to Gnosticism. This is ingenious for a few reasons. Number one, it will never be out of place. It is an excellent resource to link Eastern and Western storytelling as it will always fit both simultaneously. Secondly, because it pulls from everything and there are so many varying sects, it is easy to add on other myths and beliefs onto the main theme. For example, naming the Archons after the Ars Gosha, even though Gnosticism gives them their own names. Genshin Impact's use of Gnosticism is novel yet excellent. It allows them the use of an already present and well-developed storyline, yet one that is certainly not overused considering its rarity. It acts as a perfect bridge between Western and Eastern beliefs and cultures. It also allows them to supplement their lore with whatever other myths and beliefs they wish. It is an excellent framework for a game that plans on delivering distinct and varying regions, all while maintaining a central storyline throughout. So once more, thank you all for listening. If you managed to get all the way through, please consider subscribing or checking out the TikTok. I'm currently making an Ars Gosha breakdown of the Archons there, and let me know if you have any questions on Gnosticism or lore you would like me to look into so we can have another poisonous vision. As one last note, this is listed in the references in the description, but I would like to shout out GnosticismExplained.org. It is a wonderful reference that succinctly explains the history, beliefs, and texts of Gnosticism. Not only that, it is exceedingly well cited, providing references to everything down to the page number. So if you are interested in anything Gnostic, or Norse for that matter, please check out the work of Daniel McCoy as he has done a fantastic job compiling all of this.